good. This one. There we are. Got it. And so you let me know when I should begin? Yes, um, you can start whenever you're ready. Great, wonderful. Uh, first of all, I'd like to thank Rose and, and the Barefoot Club for having me. Uh, it's, a, it's an honor, it's uh, flattering that uh, the work that we started a little while ago uh, gotten international attention, uh, but it makes a lot of sense given that it's an osteopathic community. Uh, and I'll touch upon that a little bit as we go along. Uh, for those that are here now and others that join in afterwards might uh, miss a bit of the breakdown. Um, I've sort of uh, divided the talk up into uh, different portions. Uh, one is the origins of how this work started. Uh, and then we've been doing the work for about 15 years. There's the early years, the middle years, and then more recent developments that we've had. Uh, kind of they, they split themselves up into that, those categories. So I thought I'd uh, split the talk up uh, accordingly. Uh, as Rose and I just discussed, if there's anybody that has any questions, please feel free to uh, identify the question, uh, whether it's by raising your hand in the chat. I, I believe Rose will be the moderator. So you can please just give me a signal to, to take a pause and we can answer the questions as they're going on. Uh, I'm a big fan of, of this work. Uh, I feel blessed, I feel fortunate to have participated in it. And so I could speak uh, about this at length. Um, so it's best when a question comes up, just identify, we'll take a pause and we'll address it and then move on thereafter. Um, and so uh, I, can, I can start at the beginning. So in a, once upon a time in a galaxy far, far away, uh, this work started uh, originally in uh, a, a pivotal ev event that happened in 2005. Um, there, well, even before that, my colleague Sylvie Erb, uh, E R B, uh, she's originally uh, Swiss and has lived in the U.S. for the past 30, 40 years. Um, she was doing trekking in the mountain ranges of uh, Pakistan and India, in the Himal Himalayan Karakoram and Hindu Kush mountain ranges. Way they, where they intersect, it's around the border between India, China, and Pakistan. It's a trekker's haven. People from all around the world go there to, to trek in the mountains. Sylvie did this uh, as, a, as a birthday gift to herself. I won't say what birthday. <laughs> um, and so she had spent seven weeks in the mountains. This is in 2005. Uh, August uh, to July, she spent trekking in the mountains with the guides uh, that were taking her around. Um, she ran out of money at a point, so she offered to treat the guide, as we osteopaths do, use our hands whenever we get a chance. She treated the guide, she treated his family, and uh, got to really uh, appreciate the people, the culture, and the region. Uh, so Sylvia returned back to New York in uh, August 2005, and then in October, in exactly the area where she was trekking. Uh, the, the focal point was in Muzaffarabad, in the mountains. There was a, a 7.6 a magnitude earthquake. And in the mountains, it literally just broke off mountains where you see a mountain like this, part of it would break off and just crumbled on top of people. It happened at about 8.56 in the morning. So a lot of families were having breakfast and uh, the mountains in which their huts and their homes are just cr crumbled upon them, uh, leading to many, many, many injuries. Uh, afterwards, we realized there was a lot of amputations. Pakistan has done a lot for stump uh, um, uh, evolution uh, for the amount of people that needed amputations and thereafter prosthetic supports. Uh, all this happened in uh, October 2005. Uh, Sylvie uh, immediately returned then as soon as she could, uh, as she could have in February and July 2006. She went and she was working with different camps and different hospitals uh, trying to help as best as she can. Uh, Sylvie is a physical therapist and an osteopath. Um, Sylvie and I both did our training at the Montreal College of Osteopathic Studies. Uh, I can uh, share that I'm a professor now. Uh, at, it's uh, known as a CEO, Collège d'études osteopathiques de Montréal. Um, and so we're both CEO graduates, and it's a uh, traditional osteopathy, complete and, and full. Uh, I've, got, I've gained a lot of respect for the ESO uh, from having worked with uh, a couple of your graduates and colleagues. Um, and so I know we share very, very similar values. As I imagine you're aware of as well, that's not necessarily a guarantee depending on what institution people attended. So Sylvie being a physical therapist and, and properly complete trained osteopath, uh, returned back to the, uh, to the mountains and worked with camps and hospitals, but realized she only had one pair of hands. 
And osteopathically, uh, we don't just write a prescription in five minutes and move on to the next. So we dedicate a certain amount of time, uh, which uh, caps how much of an impact she felt she could have had. So when uh, Sylvie came back after her second um, uh, camp in uh, July 2006, she put out an announcement uh, trying to recruit other osteopaths. Um, at the time, I was a graduate and I was still doing my uh, research uh, to get my DO. Uh, but when she put out uh, that announcement, I was part of the initial batch that responded. And uh, so began Osteopathy Without Borders. Uh, I remember when I finished my studies, and this might uh, resonate with some of uh, the students here. Um, Rose, is everyone students? Okay. Uh, and so as I was a fresh graduate, I remember uh, thinking, how can I apply the skills and the knowledge that I've just learned? Uh, how can I apply it to the betterment of people, of humanity? Where is my path? Within a month, I get a, an announcement for Osteopathy the Borders is recruiting uh, osteopaths to take a humanitarian mission to Pakistan. My family background is Pakistani. I'm born and raised in Montreal. I was like, I'm one of the few Pakistani background people that I know of, and I'm not organizing this. This is a clear sign that this is where my uh, efforts and skill set should be applied. Uh, and so people oftentimes associate me with the origins of it, and the credit goes to that pioneer, a wonderful person, Sylvie Arab. So she put out the announcement, I re replied, and in 2007, I believe it was July, did we make our first humanitarian mission. Um, we went purely for humanitarian purposes. And I, I, I specify this now because uh, you'll see how it's evolved over the years, but we went to go help people that were suffering. Uh, through different social contacts uh, that Sylvie had, we got into contact with some influential uh, Pakistani families. Uh, notable of which uh, there's Alima and Suhail Khan. Um, Alima is a socialite, uh, they are humanitarians. Alima's brother is a former prime minister of Pakistan, uh, Imran Khan. Imran Khan used to be a cricketing legend back in the 80s and 90s, uh, turned politician. Uh, their family is, is uh, extremely well networked, has many resources, they've done a lot for Pakistanis. So as we're um, indicating our effort uh, or our want to help uh, initially, in the first years, our time was split between two regions. One was in the mountains. So there's the Himalayan mountain range, the Karakoram, and the Hindu Kush. The three intersect, and there's a, a monument at the exact point of intersection of the three mountain ranges. We drove by that every time. There's rivers that intersect. It's, it's beautiful. The top shelf of the world, uh, the highest peaks of the whole planet are in that region where, where we're working. Uh, and so through the, the, the contacts that we had from Alima and Suhail Khan, um, we were put into uh, contact with a gentleman who's an orthopedic surgeon, Dr. Pervez. Dr. Pervez was so taken by osteopathy, and he's a, he's a full licensed uh, orthopedic surgeon of over 20 years seniority. He wanted to sign up and study osteopathy. So he's going to pause his career and sign up to study osteopathy. Uh, the directors at his hospital wouldn't let him go. So uh, he realized that he couldn't give up his position to study for five years plus, uh, and he started to work with us. So as we would spend one week in the mountains, we would spend one week in the major cities as well. So the major cities being Lahore and Islamabad in particular. Islamabad is the capital of Pakistan. Lahore is another major city. Um, Dr. Pervez was uh, on the governing board of the hospital. He's a senior orthopedic surgeon known throughout the country. So he has a lot of weight to, th to throw around. He organized a meeting with us and uh, the, the, the dean of the hospital and the CEO. And I remember it was a very, very, very pivotal uh, meeting that we had because they had just heard about osteopathy. And one thing I imagine you all have to clarify from time to time as well, is there's traditional osteopathy and then there's osteopathy as practiced in America, where a lot of people confuse and DOs in America practice very similarly to MDs. There's no difference. So a lot of the hospital senior staff didn't know who we were, how we practiced. Um, and they had slated us to work with their external uh, or outpatient clinic that Sheikh Zayed Hospital uh, had. Sheikh Zayed Hospital in uh, Lahore is a government uh, hospital facility, very well established, many, many resources. 
So as uh, we met with the with the with the dean and the CEO, he explained to us, okay, we have you guys set up in our external outpatient clinic uh, with the physiotherapist. Uh, and so we're explaining to them how we work with uh, all of the body, not just musculoskeletal. And in hindsight, that was a very, very, very pivotal meeting because they were pigeonholing us into musculoskeletal super physiotherapists. And as we explained to them that, uh, no, no, we work with uh, the viscera. So literally, Pakistani culture is very much so uh, hierarchical. And so you never uh, question your superior. And this was the superior of the superior of the superior. So he, would, he had all the directors of his hospital in that meeting with us. And when we said we work with Visra, he would go get them into internal medicine to the director of internal medicine. And we said, we treat, we treat babies. He goes, get them into pediatrics. Uh, we told him we work with musculoskeletal. He goes, get them into orthopedics, so on and so forth. He basically opened up the hospital to us. Uh, and so then it was up to us to perform because we're trying to educate on, uh, on what osteopathy is. And people just, again, uh, thought musculoskeletal. Um, we had the hospital uh, to our disposal and we would organize morning and let's say uh, orthopedics afternoon in pediatrics. Next morning in gynecology, after that in internal medicine, for example. Um, what was fantastic and, and very foreign for us here in Montreal, Montreal is private medicine, is paramedical, uh, we don't work in the hospital system in, in Quebec. And so um, working in the wards, when we had this CEO and Dean's stamp of approval, everyone else had to fall in line. Nobody dared question us uh, because we just dropped his name and uh, they could not challenge us any further. People still tried, but again, we were, we were met with open arms and so much respect and so much cooperation. No doubt there were some people that were begrudgingly helping us, but they were helping us all the same. So we would have uh, residents tour us through the wards in the hospital and present bed by bed the cases. And we would select who would be the best candidates for osteopathic treatment. And we would treat them on the hospital bed, the gurney, uh, in the ward. Uh, and if we had a morning segment and we could have seen five patients each, we would have identified the five patients because in the case history, you can see who had uh, traumatic physical injuries, who had uh, surgeries, who had different diseases, different medications, and we could have mapped out who would have been uh, best responsive to osteopathic attention. So we would uh, literally organize our mornings uh, according to the case histories, treat, and in the afternoon, we'd move on to another ward. Um, as I go along, I'll drop a couple of key examples of patients and how we treated. I was reminding myself that I am speaking to students uh, and so it's important to see the beautiful uh, knowledge that you all are gaining, how it applies uh, in, in practice. Um, given that we don't work in the hospital system here in Montreal and in Quebec yet, uh, this was a level of acuity that we typically don't uh, see in our private practices. This was a level of severity that we typically won't come across. And so we had to really pivot and, and we we're talented people that were there. The first uh, mission that we took, it was three people, <laughs> Sylvie, myself, and a, and a class fellow of mine. So we weren't a big band. In hindsight, over the years, we kept the number small because uh, we are very mobile when we're there. There's a difference of taking 12 uh, practitioners and organizing transport and hotel stay and plane tickets versus three. Three fits into one SUV, one, one truck. Uh, seven takes two. Uh, we can get on a 50-seater plane flight tickets for maybe three or four. We can't get for 12. Um, and so we kept the numbers small in the initial years for largely that purpose. Sylvie Arab is a beautiful human being. Uh, if I see stuff as day, she sees it at night. We're very complimentary. Uh, and so uh, I wanted to go big. I want to take a group of 20, 30, 40. And she wanted to keep it small and uh, so that we can stay more mobile. So we'd always bounce ideas off of each other and we ended up with the group dynamics that we've had. We've been as uh, little as just Sylvia and myself. We've been as big as a group of seven. So the, uh, in 15 years, we've never gotten a big, huge group. Uh, whereas the effort that we've done here uh, in Pakistan uh, uh, sparked similar efforts in South America as well in Peru. 
So in Peru, they take groups of 20, 30 uh, osteopaths. They'll take students. It's far more Cartesian. It's far more organized. It's almost like a, uh, an external clinic for a school. So the bell rings in an hour, they rotate out all the patients, they have translators, it's a formal organized building and clinic. That's not what we do in Pakistan. Pakistan, we've been far more like trailblazers and like pioneers, uh, very unstructured. So coming back to Sheikh Zayed Hospital, where we treated in the, in the major city, uh, we would see, uh, like in pediatrics, we would treat kids that had fits or spasms they would have a high fever, uh, lethargy, though, where they were very tired, and they'd been in the hospital for one or two weeks. Here come the osteopaths, and we treat them on the hospital gurney, in the parents' arms, so on and so forth. And uh, I remember we treat uh, for the afternoon. We would come back and visit them the next day. Oftentimes, we would have cleared out the ward. When we treated them, within a day, they got so much better that they got discharged. So we would go back to the same pediatric ward a day or two later and 80% of the people that we treated were gone. The nursing staff and the doctors were dumbfounded and confused. Uh, we would go back and I remember uh, one case, um, parents of kids that I hadn't even treated were coming up and thanking me. And I go, and it's an open air ward. And I go, I'm sorry, I, I didn't get a chance to treat your child. And they said, no, no. There's a couple of kids that were screaming and crying all throughout the night for two weeks keeping everybody awake and you treated that child and they slept so everyone slept and so extended and then they were begging for their children to be treated by us so we had an impact that was very very uh, palpable very clear and uh, appreciated uh, by the people that we treated their families but not only them others as well i remember one example of a, a child who had difficulty breathing he had uh, i think six bouts of pneumonia and he was nine months old and so antibiotic after antibiotic after antibiotic i treated him and when we bet, went back the next day uh he wasn't there in the ward and one of the parents said no 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 after your treatment they took him to icu and so i was like oh whoops so i went to icu to follow up on how the boy was doing the mother and the grandmother see me they come running out of the ward kissing my hands hugging me I was like, I'm sorry, I don't understand what happened. And they said after treatment, the boy started eliminating so much mucus that he was having difficulty breathing. So they took him to ICU to monitor him uh, more closely. But uh, he started breathing more completely. And this is a nine-month-old boy. And they said after the treatment, they heard his voice for the first time. Because since he was born in all the bouts of pneumonia, uh, he hadn't been able to ventilate enough air out of his thorax to produce a voice. So they, they heard his voice for the first time. So they're kissing my hands, uh, praising us, this, that, and the other. And while I was scared that I might've done something bad, we did something fantastic. And so uh, they were wanting to come to Canada, to Montreal for follow-up treatment. And I told them to trust in the quality that we did, that he would improve and he hopefully wouldn't need any follow-up. And that was exactly the case. So these kind of cases, that level of severity and acuteness, we don't see in private practice because those people are stuck up in the hospital. So osteopathy in the hospital is such a good idea. It is so incredibly fundamentally needed. Uh, and this is stuff that I've observed over our 15 years of working in the hospital care system there. Uh, we had uh, people whose surgeries we would cancel. There's a boy who uh, fractured his arm. He went to a local charlatan who bandaged his arm too tightly. And basically his arm was all necrotic and it was in a claw. And he was slated for uh, getting his arm broken in surgery, reset, casted. After eight weeks, physiotherapy for six months, eight months. This was a seven, eight year old boy. I treated him for 40 minutes, myofascial releases, um, uh, treated the whole body osteopathically. And uh, his arm became fully straight and only his fingers were a little flexed. And the, the doctor, the attending comes in and goes, I cannot understand what you possibly could have done. They canceled his surgery and discharged him the next day. And uh, that wasn't the attending. That was a resident who had been on shift for about 20 hours. And he said, I'm going to stay with you for the day and see exactly what you guys do. I'm supposed to uh, uh, clock out in four hours. Um, I'm going to stay as long as you guys are here. And he ended up saying we're there for eight hours. So he was there for 30 hours. He could not believe what he... 
He presented the case, walked away for 40 minutes, comes back and the boy's arms in extension uh, and uh, far more mobile. He could not fathom what we did. Uh, and so he insisted on staying with us. These are little snip, uh, snippets of what I'll share as we go along. Um, now, we really appreciate the work that we did in the cities, but our, our heart was, or the reason why we came to Pakistan was to work in the mountains. So now uh, us going to the mountains uh, is, a, is a major undertaking. Um, from Lahore to Islamabad is about a four hour drive on the motorway. From Islamabad, uh, you can take a one hour flight to get into the heart of the mountains, or it's around, a, at the time it was about a 23, 24 hour Jeep ride. So you either fly over the mountains or you drive through them to get to that uh, Northern area. And uh, it's the high shelf of the world. The landing strip in Gilgit, when you arrive in the mountains, uh, is one of the most dangerous landing strips in the world from what we were told. Uh, they can't take a jet, they take a turbo propeller plane and they have to lose altitude. And if, I kid you not, where the plane comes to a stop, about 150 yards ahead of that is a market. <laughs> so if the plane can't stop, you're gonna plow into a market. Uh, and so it's very uh, rural, it's very rough. Uh, if it's cloudy, they cancel the flight because the pilot can't see the landing strip. So that's it, uh, your flight gets canceled. One year we took the flight, it was fine when we uh, took off, clouded over, so they turned the flight back around and we had to return back to Islamabad. So that was one hour flight. Then we took what's called the Natco buses, which is like a, a, a coach bus. And it was a 23 hour bus ride, uh, almost straight with no bathroom on the bus. Uh, we had kids lying on the aisle on rice bags. We had like chickens under the seats. Uh, it was not a comfortable uh, experience. 23 hours straight, we arrive. After that, we had to take a five hour Jeep ride to get to the valley where we were slated to treat. We, so this is one hour flight, 23 hour uh, uh, bus ride, five hours from so 30 hours of travel. We arrive and it was around three in the afternoon. We're exhausted from travel. We get there and there's about 50 people waiting to be treated. And there's three of us. We dust ourselves off and we started to treat and we treated till the sunset. Uh, we, we didn't leave our families and our friends and our clinics to go and rest. We went to go work. And my hat's off to my colleagues. They're beautiful human beings. Um, they're never a, a peep of complaint, uh, never uh, an ounce of uh, hesitation. Uh, so after 30 hours of travel, we treated. And that's the beauty of osteopathy. We didn't need to set up our x-rays. We didn't need to set up our MRIs. We didn't need to set up our vials and our injections and our medications. Uh, we just treated. Uh, and, and in such remote, geographically difficult areas to reach, uh, this is what osteopaths can do. They just need their pair of hands. That's it. Uh, it got to the point where uh, we'd met with, uh, and our, our network, again, it's very impressive what we do. So we meet with other very good people and we have fantastic political uh, connections as well. Uh, we met the local doctor in charge of uh, the basic health unit, the BHU, uh, in, the, in the valley. And he also has a clinic at a hospital. So he got us into that hospital and then into another clinic. And um, these people are so overburdened that they're looking for anybody that can help. Much less political uh, uh, paperwork and red tape that we have to go through uh, and allows us to demonstrate what we do. And as we get into, the, into those uh, areas, uh, we're fantastically well received. And now the, there's a, a network of uh, family doctors in the mountains. They were begging us to teach them osteopathy because they get a shipment of medication once in a month for what they need for that upcoming month. If ever they run out of medication early, they got nothing. They can't, they can't help their people. And it's one doctor for eight or 10,000 people in the valley. And so they were like, teach us what you're doing so we can help people if ever or when regularly they have to wait for the next medication shipment. So it's, uh, people were quite envious uh, of the way that we, we practice. Um, and we go from one valley to another valley. I remember we went to Nagir, which is on the other side of the Indus River for, from Hunza, uh, quite notable places in the mountains. Uh, we got there and for two weeks, they were, advise, they were uh, advertising on their radio that there's these doctors, their words, 
there's these doctors coming from America who practice without medication. God bless the people in the mountains. They're very simple people, uh, very poorly educated. And so uh, when we arrived, there was three of us that uh, first time. And there was like 400 people waiting for us. Uh, it was arguably the most difficult time of my life because in the mountains, I don't speak the dialect that they have. I do speak fluently Urdu, uh, the, one of the national languages, but really nothing in the, in the mountains. It's a combination of Farsi, Urdu, Russian, uh, and some uh, Mandarin tossed in there. It's like very local dialect. And so I had to do triage. So we told people, everybody who's uh, from the clinic in that valley and north, go home and come back in three days. Everybody who's from the clinic and south in the valley, stay here and we'll try to see you in the next two, three days. And I had to do triage. We had uh, people in the most uh, decrepit state. I had one uh, case of a grandmother, probably in her 80s. Everybody north of 50 looks like they're 80. Um, and she was coughing up blood. Her 17-year-old grandson wrapped her in a bed sheet, swung her over his shoulder, and walked three hours in the heat to come get his grandmother treated. And I was doing triage, and I had to tell her, I'm sorry, we can't treat you. We can treat her and help her. But in the context of us being in that valley for one week, we gave priority to people whose conditions we could completely address in one treatment. So we would err on the side of youth. We would err on the side of stuff that was more simple, only because we couldn't spend three hours treating one person when we could have spent three hours treating three people. So that's the kind of difficult decision making that we came across, and it was heart wrenching. Cases that you know you can help people that have no other recourse, and you decide not to help them because you're going to take somebody else that's not in as much need, but you know you can help completely. Uh, insights that I had never had in my personal life other than those experiences. Very, 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 very difficult. But now what happened is word sped, spreads like wildfire, like wildfire. And um, people would bring their aunts and their uncles. Uh, people would come back and wait. And uh, initially they would get frustrated. Poorly educated people get up after 30, 40, 50 minutes on the treatment table or, or bed and be like, okay, so where's the medication? And we're like, no, no, we don't work with medication. And they're like, that was a waste of time. <laughs> and they would leave the clinic frustrated until a day or two days after they started to see the full effects. Then they would come back with their aunt, their uncle, their neighbor, and their teacher. And uh, more and more people would want to get treated, not knowing how it works, but knowing that it is working. So much so that over the years, people would wait for our return the following year. Uh, their kids had uh, eye infections and they'd gone to the opt optometrist, uh, ophthalmologist, and the eyes stayed red, one treatment and the redness is cured until a few months. And they're, they're like, oh, let's wait for the osteopaths to come back next year. So those kind of uh, uh, results we were having with people and people were gaining trust uh, in, and really quickly you develop a reputation because it's so rare that approach to treatment. Um, it, the mobility that we have is one of our strong points in the early years. Uh, like I said, one week we would do in the major cities, one week we would do in the mountains. And so our numbers staying small do definitely work for us. We're like a band of superheroes that would be dispatched to wherever our, our talents were needed. We treated politicians at 11.30 p.m., like midnight to like two in the morning and their spouses. That's the only time we could have gotten in with them. We've treated in uh, uh, primary schools uh, where uh, we would go in and treat the 30 kids in the, in the school. And we treat them on desktops, countertops. We would treat them on um, sofas. We would treat them on the floor on mattresses. Um, I'm a relatively hygienic person, uh, a little OCD on that stuff. But when you live in the mountains for two, three weeks at a time, you really get comfortable with being dirty. Uh, we would shower maybe once in the week. Uh, we'd be treating on the floor and there's dro droppings from goats and sheep. Who cares? <laughs> I mean, literally, uh, for people that are uh, taking note, uh, go to our website, osteopathywithoutborders.com or osteopathywithoutborders.org. We have pictures of some of the work that we've done over the years. Uh, on my 
Facebook page, I think I might have some, but uh, that's not the, the best resource. Uh, we're in, uh, literally, we to get out of the mountains, instead of taking a 23-hour drive in a Jeep, you can take a pass by going over top of a mountain, and that becomes 16 hours, but you're passing by 15,000 feet elevation. Uh, and it, it this uh, beauty is uh, indescribable, a perfect raw, uh, mountainous, uh, gorgeous. And so we're treating in a valley sometimes, uh, surrounded by mountain peaks, 30 degrees Celsius temperature, perfect stillness, not a peep. And we have about 75 people, villagers watching us with perfect stillness. Nobody's distracting, no child is crying, observing a street, and we're sitting on the floor, so sitting on the grass, treating on a mattress. And we do this for eight from eight, nine in the morning till sunset, till we couldn't see anymore. Uh, the, I wish and I pray every osteopath gets an opportunity to experience that once in their career. Uh, the, the stillness and the power of the mountains, that altitude. Uh, we were treating in the shade of a hundred year old tree. Uh, and we do this for a week. Uh, it, we think that we're giving to them. Honestly, they're giving to us with those kind of experiences. It sounds very hokey. I know. Uh, I said it anyways. <laughs> uh, but it is absolutely beautiful to have those experiences. Um, and you have to be adaptable to do this kind of work. Uh, one year, I think it was in about 2018, which I'll get to in a, in a little bit, uh, we slept in 12 different beds uh, across 12 different nights. So we were all the time in our suitcases uh, because of the nature of that trip. And I'll, I'll get to that in a bit why we were bounced around so much. Um, so we would wake up thinking we're going to sleep there that night. Mm -mm. Uh, something happened on the course of that day where we had to change locations, change valleys, change uh, provinces sometimes. So uh, you really have to be adaptable. Uh, so now as we're, we're gaining a little bit of a reputation in the first few years, uh, Sylvie had the foresight to uh, work at training local physical therapists. So there's uh, Haider Ali and Usmara Zafar. Um, Sylvia put in an announcement and these two replied and were highly qualified. Uh, and we paid for, so Osteopathy Without Borders, we did fundraising and paid for their training. So they're, they're a husband and wife, a uh, couple in uh, Lahore, and we paid for their training at the Swiss International College of Osteopathy, uh, Osteopathy SICO. Uh, it's a sister campus to the school that I teach at. We have an international network. So six times a year, they would take a flight, go from Pakistan to Switzerland, do the five day long course and go back. And they did this for five years. Uh, they had a young son at the time, so they took all their family support to be able to do this but they became the first osteopaths of Pakistan uh, and they're still part of our network uh, now. Uh, I'll get back to them. So this was Sylvie's foresight uh, early on years because uh, give a person a fish and feed them for a day, teach them how to fish and feed them for life. So we, we tried to not only benefit people for the two, three weeks that our admissions would uh, last, but we uh, had now a home base that people could have follow up with uh, when needed. So that was like the first uh, four or five years of our, of our trips. Are there any questions at this point before I move on to the next period? Good, I'll continue. Feel free at any time uh, to just a uh, signal. So um, Hader and Osmara started their studies that would take five years. When we're in town, we would give them tutorials on spinal uh, mechanics on visceral treatment on all the different components of osteopathy. They were on an island, the only two people, they had no network around them. They couldn't uh, do study groups with their friends. Their friends were in Europe. So um, it, it was very special training that they got. Um, through our different connections, we met another lady, Shahima Rahman. Her family had founded a, what was originally a nursing hospital, uh, uh, which came, got into uh, birthing and midwifery. And they, uh, they expanded and became a full-fledged hospital. Uh, she believed in what we did and she opened her hospital to us. And that was more unique because uh, it was less structured than Sheikh Zayed Hospital. 
And so she was a token leader of the hospital, but there was a board of directors that she even answered to. And they were very skeptical about osteopathy. They were all butting heads and we, we got a foot in the door to try to show what we did. And again, we treated in internal medicine, we treated in orthopedics, we treated in gynecology. Um, uh, they invited us. So in 2012, I gave the first uh, course, uh, introduction to osteopathy course in Pakistan uh, at uh, their hospital, Fatma Memorial Hospital. Um, it's amazing. We arrived uh, in the morning and Pakistanis are, uh, are very proper, very official. So we show up and we get out of our, our, our transport. And uh, I joked with Sylvie because there's a, a red carpet and there's a security guard with white gloves on and a big hat and all that stuff. I go, haha, look, Sylvie, that's from my course. Lo and behold, it was from my course. And uh, they had a session with us and all of their medical staff of the hospital, 115 practitioners. And uh, they really opened their doors and gave us a lot of respect. Uh, and so we addressed all the practitioners. We invited them to ask us any questions that they had while we're treating and periodically they would. Uh, I remember there's a one boy we, in internal medicine I treated and uh, there's a boy, I'll give you the, 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 the big uh, highlights of his case. He was 18 years old. He looked like he was 11 or 12 in stature. He was uh, quite small. He had had a car accident, brought him in and they found he had multiple cysts on his spleen. And so he'd been in the hospital for two weeks, high fever, uh, could not get out of bed, used a bedpan, um, uh, and was lethargic. So I approached treating him. And again, everything is live happening as we're going along. Nothing scripted, nothing's prepared. They didn't have anybody that would screen patients before we arrived. They didn't know how to screen for osteopaths. They don't know who osteopaths were. So we arrive on site, and then we'd identify with getting their case study. And this boy, I remember I treated, and about 30 minutes into the treatment, 30, 40 minutes in treatment, his vitality, his metabolism was surging. And he got so uncomfortable, he asked me to stop, like stop right now. So I cut short my treatment. I didn't integrate as we should at the conclusion of a treatment. And I say this because uh, then I moved on to the next hospital bed. And as I'm treating the uh, next hospital bed, the boy gets up and he goes to the bathroom. And the head nurse comes over to me and says, I'm sorry, what are you guys doing? This boy hasn't gotten out of his bed uh, since two weeks. That's the first time he's set foot off of his bed. And so he goes to the bathroom, he comes and he sits down, and he starts playing with his brother. Now they had ultrasound uh, that was set to uh, map out his cysts in preparation for the surgery in three days. They sent down a wheelchair and he goes, no, I don't want the wheelchair. And he walks from one ward to go to imagery in ultrasound with his brother and the nurse was dumbfounded. So now he comes back, we finish off that day. Next day we go back to the hospital and we're sitting with the board of directors and I hear people like whispering and passing notes and whispering and passing notes. And I go, I'm sorry, is, is there anything uh, uh, particular interest? And they said, uh, there's a boy that you treated yesterday in, in, in internal medicine. He was 18 years old. I go, I remember him and he goes, He's actually in ICU today. I go, oh no. <laughs> so again, I go to ICU, ICU to see what happened, if there's any assistance. Now remember, I didn't integrate the treatment. I didn't conclude my treatment. I stopped abruptly. And the, uh, the attending doctor said, listen, I don't know what you guys are doing, but my supervisor said, I can't get in your way. I'm his treating doctor. I'm just requesting that you not touch his spleen. Uh, he's scheduled for a splenectomy in three days. Please don't touch his spleen. Personally, I don't like anybody telling me what to do in treatment. Uh, if uh, it's not an osteopath, you don't know how I work, don't tell me what to do. It's a bit aggressive, but uh, you have to be very political. I took her advice and I committed. I won't touch the spleen. And I held true to my word. I didn't touch the spleen. So much cranial sacral tension in this boy at the C0, C1, C2 junction, occiput C1, C2. Cranial base was all jammed up. Um, that's mainly what I worked. And so I didn't integrate. I didn't get to the pelvis because he asked me to stop. All this to say that uh, I finished off my treatment in ICU. And then I went back and the board of director, and it shows amazing amount of trust that they let me access the boy that they think I made worse. Uh, I'm blessed with ignorance and stupidity where I don't care. I'll just go and try to help. 
Uh, and so uh, when we concluded that treatment, he got out uh, of the ICU, his fever broke, his fits and his spasms broke, his energy came back, his enzymes balanced out, they discharged him, canceled the surgery. That was supposed to happen in three days to remove his spleen. The following year when we went back, I found out a month later, his symptoms started to return. And a month and a half later, they ended up removing his spleen. But now what I want everyone to take from that is there's no osteopathic follow-up, right? What we do on these missions is a, a party trick. We go and we uh, Shazam, treat somebody one time and we walk away, we don't touch them again. I don't know about you all, we don't do that. Typically here at home in Montreal, we don't work that way. We have two, three, four, five, six sessions, four sessions. There's a follow-up in two weeks, in a month, whatever the case would be. There, we treat a person one time and we walk away like we're superheroes. And so there's a penalty to pay when you're not applying osteopathy properly. And I paid that penalty with those patients a couple of times. So without a doubt, if that young man had a follow-up uh, with osteopathy and Hader and Osmara weren't uh, fully fledged at that point, uh, I have no doubt that we would have avoided that surgery as an example. And so the, the follow-up is very, very, very uh, key. But wow, did we develop a reputation of uh, we're canceling surgeries, people are getting spontaneously better, we're not injecting them with anything, we're not uh, giving them any medication. So we're definitely uh, getting people's attention. And um, uh, I remember uh, that Fatma Memorial Hospital, at a point they wanted to open a clinic with us. They wanted to uh, beef up their uh, complementary medicine, their natural medicine uh, faculty, and they loved us. But there was a lot of political uh, objections from the medical doctors, but the osteopaths. So it's not been without its hiccups and its challenges, as you can imagine. Uh, so those are things that we had to deal with in our work almost every single time. Uh, our ace in the hole, our advantage was that we are very well networked we would oftentimes go in from the top down, not from the bottom up. So we knew the, the governor, we knew the, the board of directors of the hospital, we knew uh, the big donors. When we got in, people didn't wanna question the people who got us in. And so that's been a wonderful, wonderful blessing for what we've done. Uh, and that's not a guarantee that it would have been done that way. So um, uh, we've met with that. I take a moment and go over what some people probably have as a, a, as a concern, which is safety and security, right? So these are the middle years. We've gone through a couple of experiences. I'm gonna give you some spicy stuff because this is a presentation to people that are interested in what we did. Let me first uh, start by saying we've never been in danger. We've never felt threatened. We've never felt out of place. Uh, if you look at um, the dynamics, the cultural, the, the religious uh, differences between Pakistani society and let's say European or Western, uh, really it's been a nothing. Uh, women have treated men, men have treated women. Uh, there's a preference for the same gender, but if that's not available, big deal, and we just get the treatment. Similar to how it is uh, anywhere. Um, we've, I'm going to give you a couple examples of what's happened over the years. Uh, in, in the early years, there's a red mosque standoff in Islamabad. So we're driving from Lahore to Islamabad. We're arriving in the middle of the night. Well, no, it's about 10 p.m. And I'm married. My wife here keeps close, close tabs of what's happening when I'm on mission. Uh, political developments, uh, unrest, weather, anything. So I get a call from her on our mobile. And uh, she goes, are you okay? And I, uh, I go, yeah, we're just getting into Islamabad. She goes, there's a bombing at that Red Mosque standoff. I go, we just got here. We didn't hear anything. We don't know of anything. And so we've been in the vicinity or in areas where stuff has happened, uh, where we've gone, um, uh, like safety and security, just the drives to and from the mountains. I cannot tell you how harrowing uh, those uh, that travel was early in the years. Uh, with China, Pakistan made uh, the KKH, Karakoram Highway. Uh, it's famous for that every mile of highway that they laid down, they had one death in construction worker. They're carving out a ledge on the side of mountains and that's their highway. And so it's been in construction for 40, 50 years. From 15 years ago when we started, uh, I use the term road lightly. We were driving at about 30 kilometers an hour. And sometimes we're doing this for 20 hours, 30, 25 hours straight. Uh, there's not road to be spoken of. 
uh, landslides happen. So we'd have to get out of the Jeep, move boulders out of the way so that we can uh, cross a path. And I'm not exaggerating. When I say the Jeep tire is here and a cliff is right here, a cliff of a thousand feet drop. No guardrail, no uh, uh, traffic cones, uh, no painted uh, warnings, nothing. Uh, I would lean to the other side of the Jeep just to make sure there wasn't weight on the half of the tire that's still on dirt. And this was for hours and hours on end. The amount of respect that I have for uh, my colleagues who did this with me is uh, indescribable. Uh, it's perilous. And it's not just for one turn of 100 meters. This was for hours and hours and hours uh, where uh, we get, we've been caught in a landslide where the driver of the Jeep yells at us to close up the windows and he floors the car because he heard speckles of dust starting to fall on the roof of the, of the Jeep. And one year that I didn't go, I've gone every year, except for when my wife was pregnant or we had a newborn. So out of respect for my wife and knowing that I, was, I had an intention of being implicated in the long term, I didn't want to burn any bridges so when it was not uh, responsible for me to go, I didn't uh, participate physically in those years. I screened, I interviewed, I planned all the stuff, but I didn't go. One of the years that I didn't go, our group was caught in a landslide and they were buried up to their knees, like standing. Uh, at blackout, the sun was gone. Uh, and one of them has this on, on, on footage. He was uh, videotaping uh, as they were caught in the landslide. They just buried their heads and waited for the, the landslide to stop. Uh, so there's a lot of natural um, difficulties that we've faced when you get into the mountains where we treat us at about nine, 10,000 feet elevation. Uh, so there's lightheadedness. There's, uh, you sense the uh, straining for oxygen for the first couple of days that you're there. Uh, one year we're in Peshawar, that's more recently where we had some uh, affiliation. There was a bombing at a police camp it was about 10 minutes away from where we were. So we heard that go off when we're, get, when we're getting onto the highway leaving. Uh, I'm giving you the highlights. It really isn't as bad as it sounds. I just want to get your attention <laughs> a little bit into the talk. Uh, but we have been through some of those uh, experiences. Uh, that was a year that we had two German osteopaths with, uh, with us. So we're debating, do we tell them about the bomb that went off 10 minutes away? Uh, Heidi and Christine, um, beautiful women, uh, selfless. And they're like, yeah, yeah, don't worry. When we came to do this work, we expected stuff would happen. They've volunteered with uh, uh, Healing Hands, I think, in Kenya. So they've been through uh, tumultuous areas. They're like, don't worry, that stuff doesn't phase us. And the reality is, if you're going to do this kind of work, uh, you want to have a little bit of thick skin because you don't know what to expect. And I say this after 15 years, we've never had an ounce of fear. We were never in danger. The group that uh, uh, also started in South America, one of our volunteers there got kidnapped. I uh, got kidnapped and was kidnapped for about two, three hours in South America. I got into a taxi to go to a market. They locked the doors and drove off with the person in the taxi. Um, we don't share this openly. Uh, but then they were trying to extort money. And the, the volunteer said, look, I'm here to help your countrymen. Uh, I, I have no money on me. We're here to benefit you guys. Fell upon uh, sympathetic kidnappers who then returned them two, three hours later unharmed. So uh, what we do speaks volumes. It uh, resonates with people, even ones that aren't for the work that we're doing. Uh, but uh, all in all, we've uh, never had anything that harmed us at all. So anybody who has that type of fear and getting implicated on this kind of work, I can only speak to the, for the experience that we've had. Uh, don't be fearful. Uh, it's not like that. Uh, you're not going to be in danger. And so um, we've had some of those uh, things. Uh, the family with whom we stay, uh, Alima and Suhail. Suhail is like our guardian angel. He organizes all of our transport, all of our hotels and uh, motels and uh, places that we'll stay, organizes our food. Uh, we've been in a Jeep and asked, what do you want to have for dinner in the mountains? And somebody sees a spinach uh, patch field. They go, spinach would be nice. They stop the Jeep, go to somebody, pull spinach out of the ground. Two hours later, we're having that in a soup. Um, I don't have those experiences here in Montreal. Uh, and so we have wonderful people that help us along the way with that stuff. So when I get the green light from Suhail, our contact, uh, the former prime minister's brother-in-law, that's it. I've learned trust in him and we go. 
24 hours before departing from here, we've still been uncertain if we're going to do our trip because of climatic, uh, like weather issues, political unrest, uh, different incidents that, uh, that have happened. Uh, within 24 hours before departing, we've still been unsure if we're even going to go. I've had one colleague four years ago, uh, uh, they were having their uh, elections and we were slated to go there uh, on the day of their elections, uh, arrived the day before, some political unrest and she canceled her participation four days before because uh, there was a, a scuffle that broke out in some small village. So uh, with all due respect to her, we uh, respected her choice and we did the trip all the same. But uh, before a person embarks upon this, you wanna make sure that you are committed to it. And again, we've never been uh, irresponsible. We've never been foolish. Um, so we, we go according to what the situation allows us to do. And we've had participants from Mexico, from uh, Germany, we've had from Italy, we've had from England, uh, across Canada, uh, so uh, we've had an international uh, presence of people. Uh, and you see the osteopathic community is a beautiful group of people. We're very empathic. We're very uh, sympathetic. We're very patient. So this resonates with a lot of our colleagues, uh, this kind of work. And we get interest from across the world. We've been, we've had to be very selective because, uh, so we don't take to Pakistan and what we do take to Peru uh, students. You have to be a graduate. Uh, and you have to have completed, uh, well, we take graduates uh, because sometimes we'll leave a practitioner alone in a ward and we'll go speak to board of directors in three buildings over. And you have to be able to uh, hold your own. If uh, a doctor who objects is questioning you, you have to be able to answer. You have to be able to describe in, uh, what you're doing. And so for that, we take people that have a certain personality type and always, 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 we've erred on the side of sharing full osteopathy. I, I'm not too familiar with the European situation, but I know there's some schools that don't uh, do osteoarticular adjustments. Some don't do cranial osteopathy. Don't, some don't do visceral. Uh, some don't treat children, pregnant women, so on and so forth. So we always took people that can do all of osteopathy, as taught by Andrew Taylor Still, uh, uh, implementing the basic principles. And so um, we've always looked at taking uh, people like that. We've treated in hospitals and basic health units. We've treated in um, medical institutes, uh, abandoned NGO clinics. We've treated at the King's Palace. So when we're in the Northern areas, we stay with the King who was the King of, of that time, um, relative luxury. We treated at yoga retreats, people's homes. We've treated at uh, one thing that was very special, um, uh, a center for drug addicted children. Uh, so in Peshawar, close to Afghanistan, a lot of the uh, opium trade or the opium for around the world passes through that uh, Khyber Pass coming out of uh, Peshawar. And so we treated uh, kids that parents would send the kids to go get the drugs and the kids would sample the drugs on the way back to the parents and become addicted themselves. So to help flush their systems, we thought we could have a big, huge impact. And we treated there for one trip, but it was too complicated. And again, we can't tease people with osteopathy. We have to provide the infrastructure for follow-up. And if there's not the follow-up, we're just teasing them. So we've had to learn to hold back on working with certain areas because it would be unfair to uh, show them uh, a taste of what is possible, but not allow them to get the proper follow-up. That, that's ultimately uh, a net loss because now they know what's possible and they can't get it. It's better for them to not know it was even possible. Tough lessons that we've learned over the years. Very, very, very tough. And so um, when we uh, have been in some of these, we've been in hospitals where the doctors were on, were on strike. Hospital full of patients, some awaiting surgery. Doctors are on strike. We walk in, everybody wanted us because they wanted some treatment. Uh, and so we've solved a lot of pro pro uh, problems for people. And we've realized that you have to play a political game. We're just osteopaths. Uh, we're we're do-gooders. We're humanitarians. We had to learn to play politics. We had to learn to be administrators. We had to learn to be uh, travel agents. Uh, learned along the way, not part of our original plan. And so uh, people used us, and we used people uh, to come sit at a table. Uh, one hospital couldn't get the doctors, but then when they said, oh, we might teach you some osteopathic te techniques, doctors came. 
So the administrators got a chance to finally talk with the doctors. Doctors were disappointed we didn't teach them anything, but uh, we're, we're, we won't cavalierly uh, just share osteopathy because if done incompletely can actually lead a person to a worse situation than uh, they would have been otherwise. So uh, we've stuck to our guns and, and really emphasized full and complete osteopathy. We never just went for the musculoskeletal uh, hole that we were being uh, painted into. Um, and that's really benefited osteopathy um, uh, over, the, over the past uh, 15 years. Any questions at this point? Okay, so coming to the more recent years. Uh, in 2018, we were in the mountains uh, as we'd been for a decade plus. Uh, we're somewhat identifiable with Imran Khan and uh, only because we have social contacts. We've, we've been apolitical. We've never camped with any po political party. But one of his political rivals was a governor of the mountainous areas and wanted to play chess using us as the pawns. So we're running a camp in a, at the King's Palace, 10,000 feet elevation, tons of people. I remember I treated one child, went to wash my hands, I come back, and I kid you not, we had, uh, uh, who were there, the local police. We had their ISI, inter-service um, uh, agency, uh, inter-service intelligence, which is like their uh, MI6. We had their interior ministry agents, and we had military. All there showed up within five minutes and put a stop to our camp on the spot. Like, you're not going to touch another person. Uh, they were given orders to get us to stop and pack up and have us leave the mountainous areas because you need specific type of visas to get into these areas. And we had the visas, but they revoked them. Uh, and so I remember it was quite uh, intimidating to see people with machine guns and all this uh, military and stuff. And there was, I think, six or seven of us. Uh, but we packed up shop. That was a year that we spent 12 different nights in 12 different beds. Uh, we arrived there, slept one night, started the camp and got kicked out. Had to go to the uh, city that had the airports there. They were there one night, had to take the flight out. So we kept getting kicked around. Uh, but that put a conclusion to our time in the mountains, unfortunately. Uh, what started our work, uh, if you don't get the flight, it's an hour, it's a day's drive, a day and a half. We're there for two weeks. We couldn't run the chance of not helping people for that period of time and just traveling. And so for the moment, we, uh, since 2018, we've no longer returned to the mountains. Um, we can't run the risk of having that kind of situation unfold again. So that's been a little bit of a, of a uh, pill for us to swallow. Uh, we'll get back there eventually, no doubt. Uh, but since 2018, we haven't been going to the mountains for the travel distance, for the politics of it and for the preciousness of our time. Uh, our efforts started humanitarian and, and now Hader and Osmara are the osteopaths. Uh, in the meanwhile, our reputation is growing. Uh, in the recent years, uh, so in 2014, I was invited to present at a neuro rehabilitation conference at Isra University. International speakers, I was one of the keynotes. Um, we've had many different institutions now jostled for trying to get our attention because we've been looking at trying to set up a local school in Pakistan and a school of osteopathy. Well, we learned from our previous experiences, uh, both in Europe uh, from our network of what we've seen, how osteopathy has been sometimes hindered uh, in North America as well. So we chose to partner with uh, Khyber Medical University whose main uh, offices are in Peshawar. Uh, and our goal was to not only train osteopaths like Hader and Osmar who got trained in Switzerland, but to start an, a school of osteopathy in Pakistan, which would make it the first in Asia outside of Japan. I know a, a chain of schools in Japan. I don't know outside of that, not when we started our efforts. So this would be one of the first schools in, in Asia. Khyber Medical University is a full-fledged government uh, medical university. We have some key players that are uh, fans of what we do. Uh, we're building a curriculum uh, with them. And so we were slated to start our first course in September 2020. Well, we're supposed to start in 2019. That got pushed off. Then COVID 2020, uh, 20, 21, 22. 
now all the ducks are in order. We're getting all the approval from their higher education committee. Uh, all the hoops that you have to jump through, our partners at KMU, Khyber Medical University, they're jumping through those hoops for us. Their board of directors are on boards for other uh, committees. So they're really fantastic partners to have. And um, we were supposed to start uh, a month and a half ago. Now that we got all the ducks in order, we realized our, uh, the, the signups were few and far between for the school. And we realized we're asking people to study five years for a profession they don't know about with no guarantee of employment afterwards. So we had such a momentum that we built up before COVID and that's gone cold. Three years ago, the people that would have signed up, signed up to do their PhDs in neurology, signed up to do uh, medicine, signed up to do acupuncture, whatever. So um, literally now I'm finalizing my fights in the next couple of days. I'll be returning to Pakistan in a month to give another introduction to osteopathy course to try to drum up interest. Uh, right before COVID, we had enough interest that I, I was forced to go to uh, Lahore to give a two-day course for 50 students because they wanted a level two introduction course. They, we got our hooks in them. And the way that I teach is I get you to feel. Once you feel, felt the primary respiratory mechanism, once you felt the uh, interosseous membrane release, once you felt uh, a tissue quality improve, I'm sorry, you're hooked. As a health practitioner, you can't forget that. Uh, the alternative is, is not as appealing any longer. So uh, we've, we've been going to give those courses uh, leading up to the start of this school. And the school is a government school. Once we get this program off the ground, it'll be a matter of copy pasted throughout the country. And this is a country of 220 million people. Um, so they're in desperate need and we can help uh, significantly because it doesn't take a lot of money for osteopathy. It takes the hands of the practitioner. So um, for the students uh, here as part of Barefoot Club, uh, know that we're doing um, fantastic stuff. You're learning a skill set that is internationally needed by everybody on every corner of the planet. Learn your craft, uh, refine your skills, and apply them to people that don't have access to it. Certain parts are saturated, I know, but uh, most of the planet is not. Uh, billions and billions of people still need this kind of care and attention. Uh, at Khyber, in Peshawar, we're, when we're working at one of the hospitals, uh, they, they got us into their NICU, neonatal intensive care unit. We were treating uh, babies born at 26 weeks, 30 weeks, 32 weeks. Uh, uh, we we're treating babies that were born at 500 grams. They didn't even weigh one pound. And they were in incubators. And what's funny is... Um, uh, next to the incubators are signs that say minimal handling, please. So don't touch the babies. Uh, touch them with gloves on from a distance, uh, change the diaper, put them back in the incubator. That's it. Uh, you can't get them infected. Here come the osteopaths, <laughs> manhandling the child in our palm, flipping them upside down and, and treating the volumes and treating the different structures uh, and doing the releases. And um, literally, I had one baby who was born at 26 weeks, jaundiced. Uh, poorly oxygenated, uh, a plagial cephalic head presentation, so deformed head. And within the course of that one treatment, the head of uh, the NICU, he's standing over my shoulder watching me the whole time. And he sees literally the head improve its symmetry within that session. And he goes, I haven't taken my eyes off of you for a minute, and I have no idea what you're doing and how this is working, but I'm seeing it in, in front of my very eyes that it's working. And uh, we treated, uh, so they gave us, they had their trust in us to allow us to the most sensitive population in their hospital, right? And so we did not take that lightly. It was amazing. We had a photographer following us for the day at that hospital, and we have beautiful pictures. We treated uh, babies that were in very vulnerable states. One boy, I remember, he, you have to have thick skin. The baby died four days after treatment. But even when we were finished with that baby, I, I didn't think it was going to work. I, I, and I, I noted, okay, we got to come back and help him. Uh, again, we just couldn't get back to NICU and we found out afterwards. So we got uh, from the head of pediatrics, we got uh, a month later report on all the people that we treated. We treated one eight-year-old girl who had been in a coma for two weeks. She came out of a coma hours after treatment. Go explain that. And so they couldn't understand exactly what we do, but they knew that we're having a positive impact. And they asked us to come back more frequently and spend more time with their NICU. Um, and so we've gotten to this point purely off of working with fantastic human beings 
and on the strengths of osteopathy, the principles that Andrew Taylor still uh, established, uh, the role of circulation, the interrelationship of all the different systems, uh, the need for auto regulation, that structure governs function, return back the structure to its uh, alignment and its mobility, allow the met uh, metabolism, the vitality to irrigate the tissues. Uh, these are the basic principles that have been working for a decade and a half, getting us to the point of now we're opening the first school. And we're not opening because people want, well, some people want it and some people don't want it. Um, what we can do once we get into that area is going to be fantastic because of the quality of the people there and the need that they have. Uh, the rarity of being able to get medical attention in certain areas uh, and certain cities, like 30 hours of travel, you can't get an MRI into that area. And the poor person is too poor to get out of the area to go get the MRI. And without it, some people have no clue on what's happening on the inside. Not us. We have our uh, diagnostic approaches. So we're, we're now with Hyber Medical University, KMU, uh, opening up the Pakistan College of Osteopathy, the PCO. Um, and, and everyone's asked us, don't take five years, try to graduate people in two and a half years. We won't concede on quality. Uh, one of my mentors, the founder of the school that I teach at, he's a purist. Uh, so we won't unleash incompetent or partially trained practitioners on the population. We can start uh, giving them taste and, 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 and under supervision, uh, but everyone wants this yesterday. And so we've been sticking to our guns and, uh, and saying we're not going to concede on that. Uh, it's cost us some relationships, big deal, I don't want them. Um, it's, it's made the ones that we're sticking with have greater respect for our qualities and our standards. Um, you never get a second chance to make a first impression. And uh, in that first meeting at, at uh, Sheikh Zayed Hospital, had we said, okay, we'll take the scraps of uh, external physiotherapist uh, patients, we would not have been at the place that we're at today. Uh, and so I encourage people to always respect the osteopathy that you've learned, uh, always respect the quality of what uh, Andrew Taylor still emphasized, keep it pure, one of his sayings, keep it pure, do not sully it with external uh, pressures. It's very understandable if it happens, it's happened around the world, uh, but don't do it. Uh, don't do impartial treatments. It's not a party trick. Uh, I take what we do uh, akin to a neurosurgeon. Uh, I'm not gonna ask a neurosurgeon at a party, can you just take a look at my shoulder? It's been acting up since my last you know, cricket match. Don't do that. Uh, do proper treatment completely. Uh, there's wisdom uh, and a method to that madness. Um, but uh, once you do it and you do it properly, uh, it'll, it'll change society. Um, uh, the, the beauty of osteopathy is uh, unparalleled. Uh, I don't know how it is in Europe, but here nobody looks at the whole organism anymore. Nobody looks at the whole patient. Uh, Hippocrates has a very famous saying, uh, never treat the symptoms, treat the person. Uh, here in the West, we're treating the symptoms. Tell me your symptoms and I'll spit you the medication that you need to take and I'll uh, put a label on you. Nothing against those people. They do wonderful work. They're overburdened. They're helping incredibly. We don't do that. We take a look at all the different systems. We take a look at, as an engineer would, uh, take a look at the whole organism and find where the problem is coming from. We won't just go and try to stop the symptom. And so I encourage all my fellow colleagues here on the chat, uh, practice proper and full osteopathy uh, because nobody else does uh, that, type of a, that type of an approach. Uh, it's coming up to about an hour and a bit since I've been talking. Uh, I could go on for the rest of the day giving you guys. I, there's so many uh, life-changing examples. Let me tell you this. I leave my family and my friends. I leave my wife and my kids. Um, I've got five kids, so it's a, a busy lot to put on my wife. I have a clinic. I teach, etc. to go to the other side of the planet to treat people that I'll never see again. Uh, the girl who's in a coma and her parents weren't allowed in, uh, in the NICU uh, uh, sorry, in the ICU, they never met me. Uh, I know I was instrumental for getting their daughter out of a coma. I'll never see them again. That's purity. It's just for the purity of osteopathy and, and for humanitarian purposes that we do that effort. I don't ask them to pay at the end of the session. We don't collect any funds from them. Uh, it's not building my reputation, my clientele. It's not, it's selfless. The level of purity that comes from it is uh, something that needs to be experienced to be fully appreciated. Uh, I can say that it's very, very gratifying and I'd be doing it a disservice. Um, I encourage everyone to do it. Uh, I have an idea without having met anybody on this chat, 
on what kind of a person signs on to study osteopathy. It's very instinctive to see a person who's unwell and to want to reach out and touch them to help them feel better, uh, to help uh, improve their malaise. And so this kind of work fits exactly with that kind of uh, profile of a person. Um, uh, like I said, our efforts started off being purely humanitarian. They morphed into becoming now academic because we have to support the school. We don't have the bandwidth to do humanitarian and build a school where it doesn't exist. So the school has to take priority for the moment so that once it's uh, standing on its feet, we can go back to becoming uh, humanitarian once again. So uh, Sylvia and I have discussed maybe as of 30 year, we can take students and do humanitarian missions with them under our supervision in poorer neighborhoods. Uh, but just for strained resources for the moment, we've had to put that stuff uh, to the side. There are other organizations internationally that I've come across. You know, there's dentists without borders. There's accountants without borders. There's engineers without borders. Like there's, there's fantastic people everywhere in the world in every profession, uh, like our own. Uh, we just happen to be the people that have done this kind of work. Uh, but uh, reach out and do stuff that is completely selfless. It's the purest form of medicine that you can practice. Uh, and and uh, pivot, uh, have thick skin. It's not going to come easily. Uh, the, the tens of thousands of dollars that have been spent to get to this point, uh, you don't get back in uh, financial uh, remuneration immediately. But over the years, I'm being sought out by different organizations internationally just off of them finding out about the work that we did. Okay, I did it. I did it without advertising a stitch of what we did until we realized it's helpful to share what we do so that it inspires others to also participate. So we, so we uh, opened up this stuff, but it's very private for me. This is very intimate and very personal, the stuff that we've been able to help people with and the reasons for why we did it. Uh, and so I encourage students, learn your craft, uh, graduate. For those who have the opportunity, do it. And for those who, who are uncertain, don't do it until you're ready uh, because it, it requires you to be in. I've shed blood, sweat, and tears easily uh, off of this effort and been more tired and more jet lagged and more dehydrated than I'd ever been, uh, been more insulted and felt more fearful and uh, insecure than I'd ever done uh, outside of this work. And so um, it's not for the faint of heart, uh, but if you have a faint heart, this can help strengthen it. <laughs> so go and do it all the same. Um, uh, that's the official stuff that I had prepared uh, for the three different segments of the early years, the middle years and the more recent years. Uh, I can now open the floor to questions if anybody has comments, feedback, uh, share your thoughts. If you think we can do stuff better and improve, we're open. Uh, this is too grand and we can't do it on our own. Thank you very much. That was really, really interesting. I personally really connect to what you said. I have you. just one question in the chat is, could you tell us what's the process um, to join Osteopathy Without Border? And I'm also very interested to join. Yes, so um, we, I just had a, an email from a, an osteopath out of Italy uh, that wants to join our work. Uh, she preferred Pakistan. So from the school where uh, I work, we dispatched to Peru and to Pakistan. People sometimes have a preference. We used to be say that you had to do Peru because Pakistan is more like pioneering efforts. We're more trailblazers. We walk into places that don't know us. In Peru, we've gained momentum, we're more established, there's a physical building. Now uh, the school is in its third year uh, of studies in, uh, with the University Catholica in Arequipa in Peru, if I'm not mistaken. Um, so uh, the way to apply is to contact the, the Montreal College of Osteopathic Studies, the CEO. Um, uh, and uh, there's a formulary that we have, so we do a I had to decline somebody's participation because she was on immunosuppressant drugs for having a kidney replacement. We can't take her to the re areas that we go and the dirt that we sleep in. Uh, and so she, so those are a few things that we try to um, look out for. We don't want to harm anybody by going. Uh, mm -hmm. So if you're to contact the, the, the Montreal College of Osteopathic Studies, uh, I'll try to uh, be able to co communicate with Rose She's been my point person thus far. Anybody who's interested, I can email you the, the links or the email addresses. Uh, once you uh, identify, the reality is initially for the next little while, we're gonna be very academic. So I'm going in a month to give a course. So I'm looking to potentially take an assistant to help teach. 
So it's tough to have somebody that I can attest to the quality of education that they got. Uh, our work is very ins uh, inspirational. We've had people that have been um, from not proper schools express interest and it breaks my heart to tell them uh, we can't take you uh, for that purpose. Um, I'm sorry, I realized I didn't bring my charger and my, my computer's gonna uh, time out in about 10 minutes. So if my uh, feed gets cut, I apologize in advance, uh, but just know that that's a possibility. I can't leave you to get the, uh, I can actually. Give me one moment, one moment, I'll be back. Highly unprofessional, I, I apologize. Uh, and so uh, my mic is working? Yes, yes, there's um, a couple more questions in the chat. Yeah. So in a response to, and the, the name that I see is Andrew Taylor Still, I doubt that's her name, um, but um, uh, follow up with Rose afterwards and I can uh, send the, inf uh, the email to our secretary that we have who manages the participation of, uh, of candidates. Uh, we screen for academic background, for level of in, uh, international travel and experience, health profile, all the basics, because uh, again, we don't want to have anybody that's harmed in doing that work. Next question. Um, how soon after graduating can we join? I'm only a second year, so uh, not me, the, the person in the chat. Um, it will take a while for me to get involved anyway, but do yeah. you prefer to take those who have been working for a few years or are you the two years of clinic practice that we get with the ESO is enough? And I'm also interested, can you take freshers graduated? Uh, so uh, the reason why we, uh, we were going to take full-fledged DOs that have uh, done all their academics and all their uh, criteria. We lowered the bar. Essentially, when I started participating, I was on a full-fledged DO and my participation was too integral. Uh, I'm trilingual. I, I, uh, my family background is Pakistani. I'm a very good resource. So we lowered the bar just to take me. Uh, and so we've kept the bar at that level, but know that we do err on experience because of the uh, autonomy that's needed sometimes in the scenarios where we find ourselves. And, and so um, uh, depending on group dynamics, we capped it off historically at about four, five people, simply because we can fit four people into one Jeep. <laughs> Uh, but now that uh, that's what it comes down to transport uh, and so logistics are a big part of what we do I didn't get into that too much today uh, but uh, jeep transport transport to and from hospitals can we stay at one person's house four people maybe can uh, seven people can't uh, so then uh, do we split the group into two half stay at one place half stay the prime minister of Pakistan Imran Khan I've slept at his house mm -hmm. I've slept in his son's beds uh, and so we can do that if we're intimate, small enough of a group. Uh, he's a fantastic human being, uh, but we can't bring a group of 12 people and say, okay, we're gonna sleep at your house. Uh, and so uh, for logistics, uh, the criteria is a graduate. I, I admire that the person has the desire to participate and they're in second year. Uh, with all due respect, you have, something, you have to have something that can uh, do good and be safe. And that's a completed uh, trained practitioner. Uh, there's a lot of areas for help. Uh, we can use help for social media. I'm, I'm recording a video to solicit students now uh, in Pakistan. Um, so there's other ways that people can help, but really we needed boots on the ground, which is still our primary focus. Uh, so completed their studies, uh, contact the person that Rose will put you in contact with uh, to fill in the application. We have a filtering uh, a process that we've uh, evolved over 15 years to make sure it's uh, most applicable. The worst thing is to meet somebody for the first time in a foreign land and realize they they don't have the chops to do what uh, we need them to do. Uh, that would be an unfortunate situation. Luckily, we've never had that. Mm -hmm. uh, we had one person from the ESO graduate, uh, Katie Teasdale. Uh, I don't know if anybody knows her. Uh, she participated back in the day. I met her for the first time when we arrived on site. The two Germans met them for the first time on site. 
Uh, it worked out wonderfully, but it, there was no guarantee. That she stayed or? Uh, oh yeah, they, they, uh, that they would have been quality practitioners. Okay. Uh, here in, in Canada, we have, it's very popular and you have uh, in the province of Quebec, 28 schools of osteopathy. And there's two that are properly recognized, meaning there's 26 that graduate practitioners onto the landscape that are <clears throat> subpar. Okay. When they apply, we can't figure out that they don't know cranial treatment when we meet them. So we try to screen for all those things. All due respect to the people here, I'm just telling you the, 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 the burden of what we have to carry uh, when we prepare a group to go on mission. Okay. Um, and have you taken anyone from the ESO? So then the answer is yes. Yep. Do you Katie. still take people from the ESO? Uh, we hadn't taken after that. And again, it's not just my decision making, it's also Sylvie. Um, how can I put this? I'm a bit of an osteopathic snob in that uh, I've come across so many patients that were treated uh, inadequately that uh, I don't wanna have to babysit the person that I'm on mission with because our, our goal is elsewhere. Our goal is to help the people not to clean up our own house. And so we've been stringent, the network of schools that we have. So we have schools across Canada. Uh, we have schools in uh, the Dutch uh, Osteopathic College in uh, Germany. We have the Swiss International College in uh, Switzerland. We have a campus in Peru. So we pull from our campuses, but uh, we have extended that network outwards. And ESO I've worked with, and I would attest to are very competent uh, practitioners. So I would not hesitate, but my voice isn't the only one that makes that decision. Okay. And what about school in France? Do you, are you aware of good schools or? In France? Yeah. I'm aware of bad schools in France. Okay. Uh, I've hired uh, af uh, people from, I don't want to, I don't want to name names. Um, I can uh, speak for the experience that I had was uh, not a good one with them. Uh, and so uh, we do our due diligence to make sure that we get proper. I know there's very, very, very good schools. I'm just talking about the, the I've had hired practitioners uh, that have come to Quebec because their localities in France were saturated with osteopathy. So they come here for promise of, uh, of more uh, clientele. Uh, but um, unfortunately, my personal experiences weren't impressive with the quality of osteopathy. Okay, shame because there's good school in there, there are so like i said uh, I, I by no means painting, yeah i'm no by no means painting everybody with the same brush yes yeah. um but i give my personal experience and so i'd like to look into it but i know there's uh, my mentors have come from very reputable schools in france uh so i would love to take their graduates okay so it's case by case then yeah okay and last question how does it work with the language barrier are there any translators or do we actually need to speak other languages no, uh, so what, what I love is osteopathy. It's, it's manual treatment, manual medicine. Uh, uh, I work with more people than I can count that I didn't, there was a language barrier. So uh, there's two official languages in Pakistan, English and Urdu, U-R-D-U. -U. Uh, I speak both. Uh, all the higher education in uh, Pakistan is done in English. Uh, so all the hospital administrators, the, the, the medical staff, the, the nurses technically should speak. When we get into the mountains, it's a little bit more open-ended, uh, whereas there's, uh, I think, over 200 dialects that are spoken in Pakistan. Uh, so oftentimes there is a language barrier, but you can say, lie down, <laughs> turn over. Uh, and so there's the basics, and, and then our hands do the talking. Uh, so you do not need to, if you e uh, speak English, you are perfectly uh, adequately able to communicate. Um, uh, especially now in the major, uh, our work will be more in Islamabad. So Khyber Medical University has a, um, uh, they have an institute of physical medicine and rehabilitation. Uh, and they're opening a new campus in the capital uh, in Islamabad. So that's where we're housing our osteopathic school. The, the Pakistan school, uh, College of Osteopathy will be in the brand new purpose-built campus in the capital. Uh, it literally got constructed this summer. Uh, completed. Uh, and so we'll be mainly focusing our attention in Islamabad, which is the capital, relatively international. English speaking people will have no problem. Great. Okay. So, what do you do at the moment? Do you uh, hire people to for, for Peru or for Pakistan as well? 
for me, I, I'm heading up Pakistan. Uh, there's only so many hours in a day. I have a very, very, very uh, talented colleague, Nadia Todorov. She's handling Peru. She's the main point person that we have. Uh, and I'm not only handling uh, Pakistan, there's Sylvie Erb. I cannot say her name enough. Please don't think that I'm the face of what we do. She is a pioneer. She is uh, a leader. Um, and she is uh, my partner. We've uh, Both of us, had we not been involved, this would not be at this stage now. Uh, and so uh, both of us discuss the candidates, uh, go through the screening process. Uh, it's all out of pocket thus far. So uh, nobody has ever been paid for any of the efforts that we've made. No flights have been paid. Uh, so typically uh, volunteers will pay for their flight to Pakistan and then everything else is handled. We, we've done enough fundraising and treated private uh, patients and donors. Uh, every ounce of transport, food and lodging is taken care of. You just have to get on Pakistani soil. Once a person's uh, there, everything else is handled. No, you don't have to pay for a penny out of pocket. Uh, and so uh, there's no remuneration, no stipend for, uh, for volunteers. And like I said, I'm speaking for our history, which has been humanitarian, which is evolving into now academic. As it gets academic, uh, we're factoring into having transport paid, flights paid. Uh, if it's uh, assisting a course or teaching a course that is paid, uh, we're not looking for handouts. Uh, for the school that we're starting up, um, we are uh, raising scholarships. Uh, for the amount that our cost is to send professors from Canada to Pakistan, it exceeds their capacity to pay. So we ask them to pay what they can, and we're bridging the gap with scholarships uh, from Alima Khan and uh, the, our board of directors that we have. Uh, they are very resourceful, very resourceful people uh, that are uh, helping us with the fundraising part of it. For, from Sharmila, thank you for attending. Okay, so at the moment there's no... Um, no other questions? Um, no. Wonderful. At the moment it's, it's only academic, either in um, or Pakistan. It is, and again, you're catching us, uh, starting back our efforts after COVID. Yeah. So everything came to a, a screeching halt. Uh, uh, we have not made a mission in three years. Uh, so 2019 was the last time that we were there, exactly three years ago this week. Uh, I'll be returning there in a month uh, once again. So that is to give a course. We need to uh, drum up interest once again to incentivize people to sign up for the school. So I've done this before. Um, it's, uh, osteopathy sells very easily, especially to health practitioners. And that's who we're recruiting from. So we, uh, we're preferring physical therapists, we're preferring nurses and doctors whom will accept uh, and then train them osteopathically and they can convert their practices over the span of the five years uh, for osteopathic practice. Um, there is a, a mission planned for Peru. Yes. Uh, if you were to follow up with Rose, I'll put you in contact with Nadia Todorov. I literally had an email from her two nights ago and she's having a presentation to recruit people for the next mission. And I don't know when it's gonna be. I believe it'll be maybe in the next month to month and a half. In Peru, we make, uh, uh, I think two to three missions a year. For a couple of years, we had somebody full all year round that was on a permanent mission. Uh, so Peru is a bit more frequent and uh, has more of an infrastructure than we do in Pakistan uh, for a multitude of reasons. So yes, there is a mission plan for Peru and uh, in, the, in the coming few months. Pakistan, there's a trip planned. Uh, again, it's more recruitment. Uh, not a humanitarian mission for the moment. Okay, thank you. Welcome. I think we graduate in eight months, so we still have some time to go. So that's it for next summer. I can see like uh, my intention is to maybe do two uh, uh, courses, introductory courses to recruit. Uh, the third one would be to hopefully uh, identify, identify who would be good candidates for our first class. Uh, it's no small task. In Peru, we've learned a lot of hard lessons. People that applied will be the first spokespeople for osteopathy in a country where it doesn't exist. So you can't just have good practitioners. You have to have good spokespeople. And there's a difference. Uh, and so we've learned this uh, with uh, internationally, our, our experience, people that are fantastic practitioners cannot sell osteopathy to sell their lives, uh, to save their lives. And so we've learned that we can't 
err on the side of that alone for the first group of graduates, future graduates. So there's so many technicalities that come up that I would have never thought about personally before uh, that factor into our decision. So hopefully two recruitment courses, a third trip maybe in around June uh, 2023 uh, to uh, interview and screen final candidates for the start of the school and classes in September next fall. Uh, so uh, if we can tack on a humanitarian mission in June, that would be uh, preferable. That'd be wonderful. You just got a question asking how long missions normally are. Uh, good question. Uh, typically two to three weeks. So uh, one week historically we we're doing in the major cities, one week we we're doing in the mountains. And so um, uh, sometimes we'd be there 19 days, 20 days. Uh, because we are stepping away from our lives here uh, when we go there. Uh, we all have practices, we all have families and other obligations. So uh, historically, our, our missions have lasted uh, around two, and a, two to three weeks maximum, two and a half weeks. And just personally, do you think it's possible to create that things in other places that they actually need the same thing? I mean... Uh, I, I don't understand. Can you please repeat? Um, do you think it's possible, because you create this um, humanitarian concept in Pakistan and Peru, and I personally fall in love with Nepal, but I still wonder if they need it. So it's, mm -hmm. it's just, I mean, yes, but they, they have healers and they have people able to heal yeah. as well. So, I mean, it's mm -hmm. just about to go there and just to ask what they need and if we, we are competent, just- so, so Very good point, very good point. Sylvia and I, I remember we were sitting at one of our first missions and we're like, oh, maybe this will take about 10 years to get up off the ground and stand on its own feet. And then maybe we'll turn our attention to South America, to Africa. 15 years later, we've not even started the school. And so uh, it was far more tedious than we thought originally. Um, and so we were thinking uh, one year Pakistan, one year elsewhere. And uh, so to your point, uh, there's people that heal everywhere, right? Uh, there's fantastic uh, healers. We are amongst that community, not the only ones, um, but nobody does osteopathy. So they have uh, witch doctors, they have soothsayers, they have homeopaths, they have uh, what are called Hakims or uh, uh, natural paths, uh, the equivalent. Um, nobody does osteopathy. Nobody treats the, cranial, cre treats the cranial mechanism. Nobody treats the viscera. Nobody does what we do, full stop. Uh, people do a version of it oftentimes, and we can network with them, but our identity is our own as osteopaths. Um, you're asking the wrong person of if there's a need somewhere, go. Uh, two weeks ago, I was in Abu Dhabi. I treated there. Uh, I was supposed to be in Florida in December. I'm going to uh, Los Angeles in January. Uh, Pakistan in December now. Um, there's a need is every and so I stopped. Uh, people flew in from Lebanon and from Kuwait to be treated in Abu Dhabi. Uh, we can't go where there's a need because that means we go every corner of the planet. So you have to be responsible with your resources, with your time, with your money uh, to be able to produce something of, uh, of net gain, of benefit. Why go and treat somebody in, a, in an area to only have them feel better for two, three weeks, four or five weeks, and to need follow-up and you're not there and you never come back. So uh, we decided to focus our attention in one area and repeatedly focus our attention in that area so that it produces something, builds something, so that it will continue to feed people from that effort in the future, even when we're maybe no longer implicated. So uh, you gotta be wise about this stuff. People are extremely well-intended. People are extremely good-hearted and sometimes uh, immature in sizing up what they will be able to accomplish. So it's good to go to everywhere there's a need, but once you leave, what do they do? What have you really done for them apart from the temporary gain or that uh, handful of people, 20, 30, 40, 50, 60, that you, that you treated, um, are they gonna stay better forever? So our goal has matured a lot to uh, establish the school, produce local graduates, produce local future professors, to teach at that school uh, for the benefit of Pakistanis. So we're, uh, people wanna come from India, people wanna come from Iran, people wanna come from uh, Japan to study in Pakistan. We won't take them because the local donors for the scholarships are interested in helping local Pakistanis, not to have somebody be trained and then leave the country and take what they got to benefit somebody else. 
So the, we'll expand. We'll go to the other place. We'll go to Iran. We'll go to Japan. We'll go to India. Uh, but each place needs to be properly established. And that's, that's the wisdom that I gained from this work that I did not appreciate before. That um, there's a maturity that it takes to do this work. You have to make hard decisions that you're forced to make and you can't appreciate how hard they would have been unless you've had to make them. Uh, and so uh, we're, we're all do-gooders. We want to help people that are in need. Uh, ultimately, how can you do that in the longest uh, term possible? And that helps... Uh, uh, you make certain decisions. So Nepal, yeah, I know of a couple of uh, manual healers in Nepal. Uh, I don't know if they have any uh, official organization that they've been able to put together. Uh, there, there's osteopaths, a couple that are uh, insufficient. One uh, young gentleman attended a course that I gave in Peshawar. He did his osteopathy, and I'm not making this up. He took his father to Dubai when his, dog, uh, his father had back pain. He was treated by an osteopath. It inspired him to become an osteopath. So this physical therapist did six months online training and then was considered an osteopath. Six months online. And so he shows up to one of my introduction classes, fancies himself an osteopath, starts trying to help demonstrate certain, and he, he was grabbing somebody's knee like he hated them. Like there's no re refinement or finesse in his palpatory skills. He didn't learn any cranial. He asked me to try to teach him in two weeks <laughs> and so um the the intent is correct the execution is inadequate and so there's a risk that people uh get their uh, a foothold and start to hijack what osteopathy is because they're just more present so uh, i have that on my radar i have that fear i know of a couple of practitioners that are not appropriately trained but they're the only ones almost the only ones so they can hijack our reputation and our vocation and turn it into something that's not pure and not complete. That's why there's a, a little bit of an urgency to do this and do, to do this properly. Uh, I know that's why I go to Abu Dhabi and Dubai. There's osteopaths that are there that apparently aren't as effective. So patients that I treat here are like, look, please come because we're not getting the same kind of results. So uh, it's that maturity to get properly trained, be properly trained to go do the work and uh, network with other people that are properly trained. And sometimes if you're looking out for a whole population when you say, I'm sorry, you're not completely trained. Let's see if we can't help you. Let's network it. You can do a lot of good. You're not a bad person whatsoever. Not at all, at all, at all, at all. I'm talking about the standards that we're trying to establish. You never get a second chance to make a first impression. If somebody can't adjust osteoarticularly uh, a bony segment or cannot uh, work with a pregnant woman or cannot work with a, a child having latching difficulties, uh, that's an insult to osteopathy if they cannot do that. My personal opinion. Uh, I, I apologize if it sounds offensive. Uh, it's just that I've had to have difficult conversations with people and it's forced me to have to come up with these standards for the sake of looking out for other people. Yeah, thank you for being honest and yeah. the wisdom yeah it's also being responsible it is and and again you're looking out for people. I, I penned the definition of what osteopathy the act of osteopathy that'll pass through parliament in pakistan in the future i'm the one who came up with that definition scope of practice mm. i was i'm not qualified to do this stuff but i'm the only one there and and sylvie and like a, the network of people i'm talking about and so we're blazing a, a, a trail that uh, doesn't exist and so when you do so, you have to do it with uh, not just can this benefit me now, is what uh, path is this going to point us down towards? Uh, and I'm instrumental in dictating that direction. Okay, so thank you so much for this evening. You're welcome. Um, I'm, I'm oh, you've been talking for quite a long time now. So um, unless anyone has any other questions, I just wanted to add on what really resonated with me was when you first started talking about when you're in the mountains and the stillness of everyone and, and the whole nature. And it reminded me of, you know, when we are doing cranial and finding that still point in, in the um, body as well. I was, I was treating on the floor, treating on a mattress, fully focused on the cranial. And I kid you not, there's a herd of sheep that graze past my shoulder while I'm treating. <laughs> uh, a shepherd was bringing his flock through that part of the valley. I never get that in Montreal. 
Uh, and so uh, that uh, the stillness is the best way that I can put it, the silence. We're at 10,000 feet elevation in 40 degrees weather in the shade of a hundred year old tree. I cannot describe the feeling. And, and with, with sheep brushing past my leg, I'm scared, impressed, and focus on treatment all at the same time. <laughs> it's incredible. Yeah, and so uh, those kind of experiences are very, very, very profound. Uh, and, and the stillness of what that can breed and the level of dialogue with the tissues of the patient, you don't speak the same language. You got one shot to treat this person and you'll never see them again. Mm -hmm. It's pure. It's completely pure. I'm going to end the recording here.